Stellaris is a massive game, both in terms of its amount of content, complexity of its mechanics, and of course the actual size of the games across literal galaxies. When you first get in started, you are bound to make some mistakes. Why not learn about them first so you can avoid them later? Today, we're going to count down the top 10 noob mistakes in Stellaris. Thanks for the idea, random citizen. Now onto the list. Coming in 10th place, we have Not Using Edicts. This one is coming in at number 10 since you can pretty easily play an entire game without touching edicts and do just fine, but switching them on even just once can be a massive help to give you a nice early game boost. I don't think it helps that edicts are now buried inside of the council menu, making them way harder to find. Anyway, if you weren't aware what edicts are, they're buffs you can switch on for your entire empire at the cost of consuming different resources depending on the edict. You also have an edicts fund, which will be consumed first before any resources, and this can be increased by research. All you have to do to use them is tick the box of whichever you want, and the effects will come online nearly instantly. In the early game, the Map of the Stars edict will be almost always covered by the edicts fund, and make early expansion go that little bit faster, which is never a bad thing. Later on, edicts can be used to bail you out of resource deficits or to align your empire's focus on a particular thing to push you even further ahead. It's all just little buffs and bonuses, but it's buffs and bonuses you'd otherwise miss out on if you never bother to turn them on. As I said, they're hardly essential for having a decent game, but if you want optimization, especially if it's for free, then head into this tab every now and then to see what can be switched on to give you an assist. Coming in ninth place, we have picking the wrong traditions. Traditions are something you'll be using and upgrading well into the late game, and they can bring your faction some pretty major buffs and bonuses when used right. But when you're getting started in-game, it can be pretty confusing for what they even do and which ones you should pick, should you complete them, or should you just pick up a bunch of trees at once, etc, etc, etc. Well, you can't really screw yourself over by picking the wrong tradition, you can deny yourself some pretty tasty bonuses if you go the wrong ones too early. Basically, every empire in the game will want to go some combination of discovery and expansion since everyone will be exploring and colonizing new planets. After that, it does come down to your personal preference and playstyle for that game. So let's lay out a couple of options. If you're planning on being a warmonger, then supremacy is obviously a great choice, as is unyielding should you come under attack yourself. If you want to be a peaceful trade empire, then mercantile, diplomatic and prosperity are all great pickups. Basically, just pause the game and have a read of the effects of the tree and the options inside of it before you pick one up to make sure it is the right option for you. Oh, bonus new mistake. While not always the case, finishing a tree as fast as you can will get you access to ascension perks, which can give you even more bonuses as a free perk of finishing the tree. Depending on your playstyle, this can be a serious buff, so have a read of the perks to see if any will be useful for you and burn through those trees to grab one as soon as you can. Coming in 8th place, we have Misunderstanding Anomalies. I know when I played my first few games, I was pretty confused by the constant anomaly pop-ups and I just clicked research without really knowing what it meant. While researching anomalies is a really great and powerful thing, doing it as soon as you find them is hardly ever the right choice since it'll lock your sign ships in place until they're done and any bonuses you get from the anomaly in that system won't be within your borders, so run the risk of being taken by another empire. When exploring, leave every single anomaly you find for later, and once you've expanded into this system, you can bring someone in to investigate. Any bonuses you get will already be within your borders, and if you're managing your fleet correctly, you won't be compromising on your exploration efforts in the process. Speaking of which, you need to make sure you're regularly expanding your civilian fleet in the early game to increase your rate of exploration, expansion, and exploitation. I like to have three sign ships basically as soon as I can afford them, and have them all on exploration to start off with, without bringing one back later to research anomalies and special projects, especially if they have the skills for the job. At least two construction ships is highly recommended, so you can have one to expand and another to build everything in these new systems. Of course, colony ships will build themselves when you decide to colonize a new world, so make sure you have all the necessary resources for at least one of those at all times for rapid expansion. You don't need a massive armada of civilian ships, but if you stick with just the starting set, you're going to fall behind pretty damn fast. Basically, as soon as you can afford to, expand to at least what I've mentioned here and get them all working, whether it's expansion, exploration, or even using a sign ship to clear anomalies in your borders. As long as they're doing something for you, you can't really go wrong. Coming in sixth place, we have not using automation. Sometimes queuing up all of those tasks manually can be a massive pain, and that's where automation comes in. Sticking with ships for a moment, you can set both science and construction ships onto automation for a few different things. Construction ships will automatically build anything they can within your borders, like mining and research stations. Science ships can be told to do a range of tasks automatically. The default is exploring and surveying, which will cause them to do just that to discover new systems and survey them for expansion. You can also choose to investigate anomalies, and they'll do just that, but be warned, there's no guarantee they'll stick to those within your borders, so I'd only use this sparingly. 
Then you have archaeological and special projects, so again, they'll seek out either of these tasks and complete any that they can. Sometimes they'll get stuck with pathing or be blocked by enemies and reset to idle, so keep an eye on them for the idle icon to make sure they're always doing something useful. Outside of ships, you can also automate a few other things in game to make things easier. You can automate planets so they'll build whatever is best for their designation. You can automate research to choose whichever projects it feels is best. You can automate what designs to use in your battleships. Eventually, I'd recommend going fully manual on as many things as you can if you really want to min-max and learn all there is to learn about the game. But to start off with, automation is your friend and will save you some time and brain power while you get to grips with the basics. Coming back to planets, yes, you can specialize them, but even if you do, you should be the one dictating what your planet's designation is, and all that means is this button here. You look at that planet and what your empire needs and select whichever makes sense for your specific situation. This will do a couple of things. First and foremost, it'll give you some slight bonuses towards the area of production, which you can see by hovering over each option. Secondly, it'll give the automation something to work with as it now knows what kind of production to specialize in. It is strongly recommended to manually set the designation of every single planet you colonize. The auto designation gets wonky real fast, so as soon as you get a new planet, decide the specialization, switch on automation, and forget about it. If you need to change designation later, it's as simple as a couple of clicks, so it's not the end of the world if you pick the wrong one at first. Coming in fourth place, we have resource management. This is one of the most important mistakes to avoid as it can quickly tank your game if you don't get on top of it. Obviously, resources make your empire work since they are produced and consumed by basically everything in some way or another. Energy is required to upkeep ships, organic pops require food and consumer goods, and minerals are required to make alloys which make basically everything. Getting into a major deficit without significant reserves or any one of these resources can grind your game to a halt as you'll very likely be unable to progress, especially not at the standard pace. Don't get me wrong, going into the red now and then happens to everyone, but staying in the red with only a few hundred resources or less in the bank can quickly send your game spiralling. The problem with this mistake is there is no one size fits all ways to make this one, so some general advice is the best I can offer. Always be keeping an eye on your resource income to check for any that are getting particularly low. Whenever you colonize a new planet, consider specialising it to produce the lowest resources or maybe even building production buildings on any planet that has room. Certain buildings, such as the Alloy Founders, can only be built once per planet, so if you find yourself in a spiral but all your Forge Worlds already have one, pop one down on another planet. Sure, it might not be at the peak of efficiency, but if it gets you out of the red, that's all that matters. You should also make use of the galactic market to stay in control of deficits, as well as to sell any excess resources, especially if you reach maximum storage. You can either set up monthly trades or buy and sell in bulk. Just make sure you get yourself back in the green without trades as often as you can to keep your empire safe should you ever be cut off. Coming in third place, we have not building armies. This one requires quite a balance of spending since in the early game, alloys can be pretty hard to come by. Star bases need them, colonies and other civilian ships need them, so spending them on military ships when you're not doing any fighting seems like a total waste of resources. But if you come across something blocking your way out of your empire or you stumble into an early war, only having three ships will be catastrophic and building once you're already under attack is far too late. As soon as I start any game, I max out my starting fleet in the fleet manager. Whenever I have some spare allies not immediately being spent on anything else, I reinforce the fleet until it's full of ships. Even if you don't need or use them, they'll be there should the need arise. Plus, starting bases start with service umbilicals, so the upkeep cost will be pretty minimal if you're worried about that. It's always better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Later on, you want to continue to expand your military, even if you never have any plans of using it. Building up your naval capacity and eventually having fleet sign entrances to your empire is never a bad idea. Just because you don't want war doesn't mean your neighbours will feel the same way. Carrying on that theme of having it but not necessarily needing it, not building star bases. Now this one is fairly similar but it expands beyond just the military side. Of course, build star bases in choke points inside the empire with weapons and defence platforms to stop enemy invaders in their tracks. But star bases offer a massive amount of utility outside of just fighting invaders. Of course, they're where most of your ships are made, and if you play the whole game with a single starbase in your home world, fleets several light years away are going to be waiting a long time for reinforcements, so spreading shipyards throughout your empire is never a bad thing. As well as this, you can build starbases in systems with rich planets to increase trade possibilities, or even make it easier for commuters to travel between planets. Build solar arrays for extra energy, listening posts for intel, service umbilicals to keep fleet costs down, there's a massive number of buildings with something useful no matter where you build your starbases. Yes, you don't only have a limited capacity, but make sure you're actually using that capacity in the first place. And coming in first place we have trying to fight fallen empires. This one is so high on the list because of just how devastating it is when you don't understand how the game works. Even when you've been playing for a while and avoided every other mistake in this list, making this one can easily end your game if you aren't willing to let go of your pride. If you weren't aware, fallen empires are an empire type that can spawn in the galaxy, and they're basically just remnants of a once great empire. But don't let the once great part fool you, however, they are still insanely strong compared to anyone else in the game. And even towards the end of the game, you'll need extraordinary power to take them on and stand any chance of winning. If you take a peek inside their land, you'll see they have fleet power in the millions, so any attack is pretty much pointless. 
but not only do you have to avoid attacking them, you also have to avoid being attacked by them. If you settle on a world too close to their borders, they can take offense and demand you retreat from that planet or go to war with them. Just take the loss of the planet as there is no way to beat them before you get to the super endgame. I would generally advise avoiding these wars until you're a more established empire at all times anyway, but against these guys, just pray you don't start new one with a temper, otherwise it's pretty much a game over. And that's my list. Leave any mistakes you think should have made the list in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and if you want to know which bits of Stellaris DLC are worth the money, then check out this video to see my tier list of every single piece of content.